For almost a decade on my TV show, Interview with Ed, I've been interviewing extra-dimensional beings and consciousnesses from a number of different realms. Many of my questions have been answered, but with every answer comes more questions. Join me on my ongoing quest to find out who are we, why are we here, and where are we going? Hello, everybody. Super excited about uh, today's guest who is here with us, Wendy Kennedy. Uh, you, it's been a minute it's since we've it talked. Has. It was. <laughs> it was a minute. Uh, the interview with Ed Journey started with you. Um, I have, I often give you credit that our conversation, uh, that, that um, soul contract concept was uh, truly the inspiration for the show. Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm, it's amazing to me. Um, you know, when we make these decisions, we we take steps. We don't know where they're going to go. And you look back and you're like, wow, that was a big pivotal point. So I'm thrilled and over the moon and excited to see the success that you've had with uh, Interview with Extra Dimensionals. It's, it's wonderful. At the time we were, I was producing the Citizen Hearing and going through a lot of stresses and actually um, called, I had a couple sessions with the piece to help me deal with some of those uh, things. And not knowing the impact that the in interviews with Ed had, I was so focused at that time on the citizen hearing, thinking that that was like, that was the thing. And, it, and it's funny, for many years, Gaia was trying to get the distribution rights to the citizen hearing. And we were going back and forth and our investor wasn't happy with the offer they made and all this stuff. And, and then I kept saying, well, I've got this other show interview with Ed, you know, maybe you guys want to take a look at that. No, nah, no, nah, we don't do channeling. They said, uh, that's, that's all crazy stuff. Then eventually, you know, uh, that's enough, what crazy stuff. <laughs> that's what, that's what they said. That's what we, we don't do channeling. We don't do channeling. That was uh, what they said in the beginning days. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, um, enough people in the in the circle there at, at Gaia I kept saying, no, you really should look at Ruben's show. It's, it's got some good stuff. And then, um, uh, and then eventually they reached out and they're like, okay, I think we're going to take your show on, you know, very limited sort of well, small deal initially. And then, um, and then they aired it. And then it, from what I had heard from the other, um, uh, producers and people that work at Gaia, then it soon became their number one show. And, and they were like, okay, channeling, here we go. Yeah. On board now. <laughs> On board now. So, uh, they started, um, you know, they requested the season two, and then they started exploring other channeling um, uh, projects, uh, you know, within their teams. And, and uh, I know, I don't know, if, I haven't paid attention, but I know they were working with Daryl uh, at some point. I don't know if it ever turned into anything, but so anyways, it's funny to see the evolution of the subject matter of the audience, which was such a niche thing when we started. Mm -hmm. And, and now it's become, it's overpassed, you know, that the ideas of like citizen hearing and, and that kind of thing. So thank you for, uh, again, for the inspiration. And, um, you, we were talking about that, that initial, the, you know, the UFO meetings that I was holding, uh, back yeah. then and, and you had said on the phone. Something could, would you mind repeating, you know, your, your sort of apprehension? Initially? Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, somebody contacted me on Facebook and they said, you know, Wendy, this is going on. I think you need to come. I didn't know this person. I was living in LA and, and it was in Marina Del Rey. I thought, all right, well, for some reason, I feel like I need to go. Um, I know that sometimes with people in the UFO community, it's a little more analytical. So it is that idea of, oh, that channeling is a little further out there. We don't know what mm -hmm. to make of it. It's not quite the same thing. These are separate. But I felt really drawn to go and go by myself and mm -hmm. not knowing what I was walking into. And and this is just really not my personality. I'm, I don't always do well in in larger groups and I had no idea. Um, so I thought, all right, well, I'm just going to go ahead and go. And I did. And yeah. I came many times. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, we were doing them. So just yeah. for context, um, how Wendy and I sort of met was uh, I was teaming up with another gentleman at the time when I was producing the citizen hearing. And um, we, we would hold at my studio in the marina, 
we would hold a week or no, monthly UFO meetup group. It was it was sort of we called it the UFO media meetup group or something like that. And the idea was to bring people together in the industry, you know, the Hollywood industry, to have the conversation around UFOlogy and and um, and uh, we did that every every Tuesday, and it started with like. 10 people and then uh it, it got very large and some of those because we had the space yeah. um but uh yeah we had and we would bring in special guests every every month um to sort of have the topic around ufology but it was very nuts and bolts ufology and i remember we would pass the mic around um and you know you were there and you would say yeah I'm, i've had some experiences of the sort of like have been <laughs> daryl Daryl, who I had no idea was, you know, Daryl, you know, channeling Bashar, um, you know, the mic would come in. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, you know, in the industry doing some CGI stuff. And yeah, I had a couple experiences. And then the mic quickly get faster. So not knowing who you guys were in the in this field of, of channeling was, um, was sort of a fun uh, exploration and, and fun uh, realization. So, uh, again, thank you for for taking the, the initiative and showing up. And again, at that time, I was just, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, I was just curious. <laughs> That's the best way sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, and, was, uh, that was 2014, so it's been a while. 20, 13, yeah, 14. well, 20, 2013. I think we started the the group around 2012, actually. Um, 2011, uh, because I was mm. doing, I did the screening, the uh, L.A., uh, premiere for Thrive. I don't know if you had yeah. came in at that point. I don't know if yeah, you would come to those there for that. So that's yeah, 2011, and then um, and then it developed, uh, and then we had the conversations around, um, uh, you know, connecting with the Palladians, and, and that's that's when I I was like, okay, yeah, there's something, uh, there's something to all this channeling stuff. They're saying all the right things to fit into. Uh, at that time, my cosmology of the UFO um, phenomenon, you know, the ET, the abduction phenomenon, the ET, you know, I'd been talking at sort of nuts and bolts with the military people and the, uh, the experiencers. And what, I don't know if you knew, I was going and hanging out with Yvonne Smith and her experiencer groups. And they had, uh, many of them got to a place where they were okay and comfortable with the abduction phenomenon. However, many were still in this sort of fear-based, the AETs are evil and they took me against my will. Yeah. And then they, they thought they were evil. And then what the main thing that sort of got me to switch my gears was just logically that never set well because I was like, well, you're here, you're in good condition. And many of them, <laughs> I know, yes. many of them had the famous stories of, um, different people with different sicknesses getting healed. And I had heard that story over and over again of people having, um, who had sometimes terminal illnesses were now all of a sudden better. So I was like adding up all these, all the data sets. And I was like, well, this doesn't make sense that this, this uh, phenomenon isn't, is a malevolent thing. Why would, why would they put you back, go through the trouble of putting you mm -hmm. back into your bed at night? Why would they keep you, um, uh, healthy. It's much easier just to hit the eject button from the uh, from the ship, right? <laughs> they throw the We're garbage done. out. We're done. <laughs> okay, thank you. We took what we needed. Um, so I was sort of making these correlations and connections through my research, and then again, the soul contract idea was like, ah, oh, that makes yeah, that makes so much more sense that these individuals had an agreement, and just from a data set standpoint, that just seemed. It seemed to fit. And then that's when I started diving in and I invited you into uh, my studio at the time. And I was like, Hey, we're going to do this thing. I don't know what we're doing. We're going to do this interview. And, and initially I thought I was just going to take a little five minute snippet of the interview and create this bigger documentary. And, uh, honestly, after that setting, uh, my mind was blown. I, at the time I was like, oh my God, there's so much information here. I can't cherry pick the information and just put five minutes of it like this, the, the world needs to see this. So, uh, 
So that was when I was like, okay, switch this idea from a documentary. Let's go into more of a longer form TV series or, you know, and, and just put it out there and see what happens. And um, you, you were already well established at that point. I don't think I even knew how well established you were as a channeler at that point until I put it out there. And then, uh, you know, I started getting all these views and comments and, and, and I was like, wow, okay, well, either the subject matter is really uh, everybody's hungry for it or, or Wendy's just a rock star. Turns out Wendy's a rock subject star. Subject matter. <laughs> well, subject no, matter. No, 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 Wendy's a rock star. Because I, other channelers at that point, I had started you know, doing it and putting it out there and they didn't get near the hits or near the views as your episodes. So, um, so it's a combination, but for sure, you, you have been a rock star in this field for, for a long time. And let me ask, how has since, since that interview with Ed and Gaia, has that, has that made any impact on your work or anything? I, well, I certainly people, a lot of people will say, oh, I found you on Gaia. Oh, okay. I, I, I saw you in the interview with Ed. So, okay. you know, thank you for that. Thank oh, you thank you. Sharing the message. I really appreciate it. And, you know, it's, I think it's helped open people up for sure um, to, see that there's something to it, that it's not all just completely out there. And um, I think sometimes until you really experience it, it's hard. It's hard for people to really get it. Mm -hmm. Oh, so over the years, I, you and going to a couple of your events back then, uh, the one that I filmed and I had sort of that opening sequence that I created. Um, there's been uh, an evolution in your channeling. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, uh, I wanted to ask about, uh, because now, uh, light language is such a key aspect to, um, your message and to, to the sessions. And I wanted to ask about when did that come in and, and have you always been doing light language or when did you, how does that work? Yeah. If, if I had no idea that it was coming, <laughs> or that oh, okay. it would play such a major role in my yeah. work. So I've been channeling, um, I, uh, gosh, I think nine, uh, 27 years, something like that. Wow. It's been a really long time. And, uh, when I first started, I was working with the Arcturans oh, and okay. my own angelic guides. And it wasn't really until about nine months, a year later that the Pleiadians came in because they were working waiting for me to channel verbally and I was doing automatic writing. And so when I would work with the Arcturans, they would, I would see symbols and I would draw the symbols. Okay. And I was like, well, what is this? And they said, well, it's a star language. And I was like, okay, but I would I go back and I look at my notebooks and it's all through the notebooks. And then that kind of went to the wayside when the Pleiadian Collective came in. Mm. And, uh, you know, I work primarily with them when I work with the public. It, I did it for years in private sessions, which I don't do anymore. And now with the group work, it's always the Pleiadians who take point. But I also work with a lot of different beings from different star systems. And um, they said to me one day, they said, it's time. It's time to start working with the language of light and drawing the symbols again. Okay. And um, I was like, really? <laughs> was it really uh, what, around uh, what year was this what year was this um okay it's five years i think probably about seven years ago okay uh, so seven. still light language is a little bit fully like right now it's 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 getting yeah, widely accepted and and uh, but at that time i think there was still like hmm what is this thing <laughs> I mean, I think Judy Satori had been out there for years, but um, there might have been just a handful of people who were out there doing it. And um, for me, it really was about the codes, the physical written form of the language of light. And, uh, you know, I was like, OK, you're going to push me outside of my comfort zone again, aren't you? <laughs> right. Like, Yep. Uh, so I started and it. It started with a single course where we utilized the symbols um, as a as part of the course. And then every subsequent course and every subsequent thing that we've done has has involved the language of light or the galactic light codes because it is a piece of spiritual technology and it really helps us to find the frequencies that we need in order to adjust our energetic field to match that resonance. So mm -hmm. that's part of why. 
um, it's become so important because it bypasses the mind and, you know, the mind gets so involved in all of, all of um, the information that we hear and we try to filter it and, and we can't do that with the language of light. We just have to receive it. Absolutely. Yeah. That I did an episode on uh, sort of a spontaneous episode actually uh, on light language because it was becoming so prevalent around my feel that different people and all these people were talking about like, okay, I have to address this and go into it. And there was a, a few members of Lisa Royale's channeling group that were uh, really exploring light language. And, uh, and then we had a translator of light language from Japan who was able to sort of take it and then put it into language, but she only spoke in Japanese. So how I got sort of sucked into it is she was asking me, if could you translate for me translating the light language and I was, this is not going to come out <laughs> well the telephone game right never does so i said sure and then i sat in on a session and i'm like what is happening here okay i need to start filming this um but it, it's it helped me really explore light language and to understand it and to try to to um feel it so gave me uh a different viewpoint and uh, an appreciation for your work and for just all of the the light language practitioners out there that that is coming through. And when you really pay attention, oh my God, there's similarities in um, in the different frequencies. So I know you you have different. Uh, I, th- I guess it, depending on the beans, you have sort of yeah. different ranges and and um, and I'm from week to week or month to month when you do your sessions, I'm like, oh, okay, yep, I've heard that one before. Yep, yep, okay, this is this is coming in similar. But I'm also finding correlations with other channelers mm. um, when they, and I'm like, oh, yep, heard that one before. And so I'm like connected all the d- dots as far, as far as the, obviously without scientific scrutiny or anything like that, you're not going to get the, the details on nuggets, but at least for my ear or in my heart, I'm feeling the similarities and and the perhaps the the types of beings and languages that are coming through. Yeah, so. sometimes I can't even tell exactly because um it's like they braid their energy together. So sometimes it's several groups coming through at once. <laughs> right, right. So it's not just one single group. And you know, I did a, a course and uh I was just talking to somebody about it today. At some point I would love to bring it back. It it's um in integration of galactic archetypes. And so beings from the seven major systems came through for each of the codes that we did for that system. And their energies were so vastly different. Um, But when we do the activations during our live sessions, I can kind of get a sense that it's this group and it's this group over here, uh, all kind of blended together. So unless it's important for us to know, the guides don't usually stop to to tell us who's coming through or sometimes after the fact they might mention it, but right. usually it's just the information that we need. Yep. Learning to get out of our heads. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's easier said than done. Way easier said than done. Um, so speaking of, so this, this range of beings that you, you know, you mentioned Arcturians, um, sort of when we were talking about that abduction scenario, you had um, mentioned, you know, at that time, cause it was our ET meetup group and, and uh, uh, we had, you know, Yvonne's group and the abductees and stuff. So you had sort of come out to me as a, as an experience, as a, as you, you've been, uh, taken by the grace. Can I say that? Yep. Or yeah. Yep. Um, so <laughs> more or less, <laughs> more, right. So uh, at least for this group, it's not, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, a normal thing. Um, but I think many people may have not have known that about you or, you know, just tuning into the channeling. So can you go into some of that and also some of the other beings that you've interacted with and how they've come through? And Yeah, well, um, yeah, I talked about it a little bit, um, mm-hmm. probably about 15 years ago, and I haven't really gone public a lot in terms of discussing it. So that's why if you look at any of the recent stuff, you probably don't see too much of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my memories have more to do with um, walking into this body probably around the age of 10. Um, I think I'm actually the second walk-in. And the memories are of coming into the body when 
I was on a table on the ship. They'd killed the body, basically. So um, one of my belief systems that was imprinted when I came into the body was that I have to fix this. <laughs> it was broken. So that was really one of the first things I had to do. Wow. Um, and one of the things that they did uh, to, you know, you talk about repairing the body. For them, it's not a big deal because they have the technology to do that. So um, some of the things that we think about might be a little barbaric, but we do the very same things to a lot of lab animals and in our scientific exploration, not condoning it, but it is it is what we do. But that was also part of a soul contract um, to allow them access to my DNA. Um, and I have memories of them taking different tissue samples, taking um, tissue from my heart um, so they could monitor it holographically and see what was going on because what happens you know, to the tissue here will also happen to the tissue there, no matter where it is. Oh, so okay. they were so able like to spooky action at a distance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so they would monitor that because they wanted to learn about emotions. Um, so, you know, I, and when the mess, when the memory started to surface, I was like, what do you do with this? It's so far out there. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's kind of coming back to, well, <laughs> how does it add to my life and what do I do with it? Why am I remembering it? Um, and how can I utilize that information as a gift, as opposed to, uh, feeling like I was a victim and the guides kind of helped me through it in terms of kind of understanding that it was a soul contract that that these beings genuinely wanted to learn more about emotions because they had um, used technology to such an extent that they could no longer tap into that spark of life themselves. They could right. not procreate. And so they needed to learn about emotions again. This is the whole point of the hybrid projects and uh, learning how to reconnect with that aspect of themselves. And so that made it much, much easier for me at that time, because I was like, well, okay, um, that has a purpose. It's not just something that's, that's, I'm disconnected from, I'm not a victim. Right, right. And at that time, uh, uh, when we were having the conversation about that subject matter, um, for me, you know, your, your approach was sort of this, this more neutral approach and, you know, they're not so evil and not so bad. And, uh, and we're specifically talking about the grace and, um, and that resonated with me because of, you know, again, looking at the data sets, however, um, we've had this evolution of the understanding of the hybrid programs and this evolution of understanding the human story of going through what we just went through, you know, of two years of, of breaking a free will and manipulation of of um narratives to to uh coerce people to to take an injection and that seems to be congruent with the with the gray story and with the the abductions and and i'm seeing i'm gonna have bridget or i don't know if do you know who bridget nielsen is uh so she's gonna be on the show in a couple weeks but we've started to have this conversation a little bit with her. She has a very different perspective now than the hybrid program. She's sort of thinking that, you know, there was this breach of free will. <clears throat> and um, I don't want to put words in her mouth. We'll let her talk about it. But it's, it's, a, it's a topic that I feel we should revisit now after having this uh, deeper understanding of the implications of of sort of being taken, whether it's a soul contract or not. I feel like it's the story is evolving a little bit. And I'm wondering what you, your take is because now we have these other things in our society that are like, no, this is not cool. Well, I think there are two different levels that we're talking about here. We're talking okay. about the level of the ego, yep. which is like, oh no, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> not right, on board right. for that. And then the level yeah. of the soul, which understands that this is all an illusion anyway. Hmm. Um, and so... I think a lot of times what will happen is that we'll agree to it at the soul level, but the personality would have no desire to go through that. Right. And so that's where it gets a little sticky and tricky. And right. um, even with all the things that have been going on on the planet, there 
you at some level have agreed to go along for this ride. Now, whether that is because you know that there is some payoff that's coming and there's, there are lessons and things that are going to help you to grow in the long run that the soul has no problem with, but the personality is not interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the part that we can't see because it's it's so complex. The things that we choose to explore in this life. There's so many levels and layers as we're creating our blueprint for this lifetime and and how we choose our family, the programs that run in the genetic line, the DNA that we have access to, the information we have access to through that DNA. Um, It's very, very complex and there are lots of levels and layers to it. And then you start to add in this idea of time as Mm -hmm. it's not linear that right. we aren't experiencing a solid timeline, that it's very malleable, that we can move to different now moments, different experiences based on our our resonant frequency. But it's just the fact that we've forgotten how to shift that energy, um, that we have the free will to do it in any given moment. We just are trapped in the illusion that we don't have the power to do it. Right, right. And I think talking about time, so that's another big aspect to what we just went through, uh, what I, I guess in some places we have still are going through, but, uh, as far as we're, we're only given so much data, yeah. some people are, can only access so much data in the time that they're at. So therefore they make the choices with, with, with that data set and with, in the situation they're in. So, um, that's why it gets sticky with this whole free will thing. Do we have our hands on the steering wheel or are we just in the back seat? And it's this constant flip-flopping. Yeah, well, okay, I'm driving. And oh, I'm not driving. <laughs> well, I think you're always driving in a sense okay. of the only control you ever have is is in how you react to the world. So that's where all your power is. You can never control what's outside of you. You can't control the collective. All you can control is how you show up or how you react respond mm-hmm. to what is in front of you. And uh, I, I think that's where people want to exert control. They want to manipulate things that they really don't have power to manipulate. Right. We never do. Um, and the reason that they want to do that is because they're operating out of a state of fear. Yep. When you're operating out of the state of fear, you're not in your power. Yep. So you that's why the the guides have spent so much time really over the last 10 years just going over and over and over again <laughs> yep, yep. about the process of manifestation and all the subtle little nuances of it. Because if you understand that, if you know how to ground yourself and you know how to get in your heart center, then you really can create anything. And yep. the collective may not want to go exactly where you're thinking you want to go, um, but That doesn't mean you have to suffer in the process because you can hold the frequency and the feelings of what it is that you want to experience, regardless of what is happening outside of you. Um, And and I think it's one of those things that is kind of hard for people to. um, I think it's sometimes hard (laughs) to to get that until you start living from that space. Yeah. because it says, oh, that's nice, but look, all this crap's going on out here. But when yeah. you do that, that's when when you stand in that space and you stand in your power, you can start putting your energy into building things that that will, in essence, remove energy from that institution or that thing that you don't like. Right. You're not trying to fight against that thing that you hate. You're basically pulling that bottom card from the house of cards. Mm-hmm. And then it eventually is going to crumble because you're putting your energy into building something else and other people will be drawn to that frequency because it feels better. And so yeah. that will start to take off. And this is how we how we really create change. Absolutely. It's one of my favorite quotes uh, I post all the time is from Mr. Filler when he says, um, you cannot change the existing you know paradigms or structures. You have to just go create a new one. Yeah. Uh, and that that's the the most, uh, to me, that's the most logical and least, um, uh, friction way to, to, you know, to get rid of the old in a sense <laughs> where you're, you're not feeding those energy sources. Oh, we got to change it. We got to change it. And it's like some, some things were put into place and they're not changeable. Um, I mean, everything is changing, but the, those, those, some of those rigid, um, institutions and, 
uh, structures and paradigms. So it's like, let's just, like you said, take our energy and put it over here. Yeah. And, and some, let the house so of many, fall. So many people haven't been able to see uh, <laughs> the corruption in those, in those institutions until right. now, until you yeah. see it all happen in such a dramatic way. And, and, you know, I think that's why, because the guides will say, you know, you'll keep coming round and round to the issue. And each time you come back round, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until mm -hmm. it's so big and in your face, you can't miss it. And I think that's where we're yeah. at. Yeah, yeah, that's, ex I think that's exactly where we're at. And it feels like collective humanity is, um, is, is, is starting to say, okay, yeah, we need to stop feeding the machine in a sense uh, through, um, the system. So I, it's gonna, it's fascinating to see how it's all going to develop, but yeah, I, I, um, and it's easy for us to get caught up and, and angry about those situations, uh, including me, I'm like, blah, blah, blah. you know, you want to go to the streets and yeah. fight and, and, and get justice, but again, take that same energy and go, you know, start your garden, start your, you know, start communicating with your community and, and, and doing what you can in the local level. I feel that all that energy and effort that's going into, okay, I'm, you know, we're in our local community, we have many people, I'm going to go down to LA and go march in this thing. And I'm like, okay, good luck with that. You know, we could, you know, share how to grow potatoes. <laughs> and then, yep. And, you know, the path is different for everybody. Yeah, so if you that's... really feel called to go and do that, then yeah. that is your path. Yeah. Um, but, and I think that goes back to the free will piece that for mm -hmm. so long, we just abdicated our responsibility in what we were creating. We weren't really interested. Um, we, you know, there are too many things going on. And it was not important to kind of see what was happening you know, most of us weren't interested in politics or interested in what our right. government was doing. And now totally. we see the aftermath of that. Yeah. And we have to stand back in our power to say, okay, this is what we want. And it's voicing what we want. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it's coming together. I, I'm going to, uh, before we get into channeling, I want to off, offer questions for you personally, because your, your personal journey is so fascinating. So guys, raise your hands if you have questions. So going back to some of the other beans. So we, we, you touched on the Zetas. Have you, have you had any mantis experiences? Yeah, they were on the ship. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, they were the ones doing the that. experiments, but they were, um, people describe them as brown or um, green. What green, I saw was yeah. brown. Okay. So I don't, yeah. Did I you don't. communicate with them at all telepathically? No. Okay. They were yeah. just standing over Not that there. I recall. Mm -mm. They were the ones running the experiments, taking the tissue and yeah. And after, so the, age 10 is sort of when that, the, the big one happened. So, Did it yeah. continue? Did it continue after that or how, how you often? You know, I'm not really sure, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> it's just yeah. memories as they start to surface. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have a formal timeline and I haven't looked too deeply into all of it. Mm -hmm. Um. It, you know, and I also have the sense that I have two hybrid children, so I don't, I don't know where exactly that fits in. Um, it was funny, you know, my brother used to go uh, and have readings and things. And that was before I started channeling when we were younger. And they would always say, so there are three kids. I was like, no, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you okay. know? Right. Um, there are only, there are only two. Uh, and then, you know, mom, is there something you'd like to tell us? I was like, no, go ask your father. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's it's that sense that that would always come up. And then when I would go have readings for myself, they're always like, you have two children. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, if that didn't just make sense, what I said is because I walked in, there was somebody else first. So there I, were three I see, I see. souls. And, I see, I see. Um, yeah. But okay. then when I would have readings, mm -hmm. um, they would say, mm -hmm. you know, you have kids. And I said, no. They said, well, no, we see two kids. Mm -hmm. And um and that was when I was, you know, in my early 20s. So as I got a little farther along and I started connecting, um, I started having memories of all of that. And that started surfacing all the grief around not being with my children. I was like, where is this coming from? I don't have kids. Right. So uh, learning how to process that uh, and what to do with that. Um, but in, in terms of where things fit in the timeline, I don't have access to all of that yet. Gotcha, gotcha. 
I'm just, yeah, I'm just blown away at our, our, the human experiences. You, you, you can't get any more, all the different uh, storylines and uh, in the emotions, for example, the emotions that you just said, like coming from so being separated from kids that you don't even know you have. Like, yeah. talk about an emotional, like that scenario is only humans can have. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just mind blown right now about the human experience and how how we set these these scenarios up from the soul level to experience these different emotions to feed it back to source or wh whatever you know the mission is here to, to why why are we being uh, so complex with our emotions and different things but maybe that's something we can ask the piece later uh, hey uh glenn has a, a question hi wendy hi um i just have to say i absolutely love you i'm on all of your monthly calls and for the last year and a half just um made a huge impact on my life and still so re oh, really great. the first question i want to ask is how can we become like best friends <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you you're already kind of that for me because i listen to your old stuff and current stuff all the time so I'd, I'd like to know a little bit about your experience and your approach to channeling and i'm i'm most interested like conscious versus un unconscious channeling when you're doing these monthly group sessions are you wendy consciously aware of lisa and the listeners and everything or do you go into trance and step back and don't really know what you're saying yeah for me well first off let me say thank you so much uh for being part of my community and sure. um i'm so happy to hear that the work is helpful for you i love it um so for me, I am what I would say is semi-conscious when I channel. So it's like a lucid dream. So yeah. I'm aware of what's happening. But if you ask me later in a couple hours, I can tell you bits and pieces. Right. Uh, and then it kind of fades. Uh, it all kind of runs together. Um, so yesterday we did a big event and I kind of talked to the guides about it yesterday before. I said, you know, what do you want to talk about? Because I never know exactly. Yeah. Uh, and they kind of gave me some bits and pieces of things. And they were giving me all kinds of downloads, things that they hadn't talked about publicly. And it's interesting because they were things that they didn't talk about during the event. Mm. And this morning I was like, well, what the heck? Um, I know you and I talked mm. about it. But <laughs> what happened? And they said, it's all encoded in there. Mm. Um, so I know that I'm aware of how do I say this? I'm aware that there is a lot more that's being transmitted oh, yeah. than just the physical words in right. that moment. Um, and I can sense that, but I never know exactly what words are going to come out of my mouth. Um, they're in the driver's seat. And yeah. sometimes um, that can be tricky because there is a part of me, especially when there's a lot of technology involved, just making, there's a part of me that's aware and conscious going, right. okay, is everything running? Right, is right. Everything working? There's that part of me that's still a little more aware than if I'm just sitting here with somebody and we're having a conversation and we're channeling. And by the way, Ruben, um, the disclosure project is going to come back around. That was very clear. They said that earlier. So I just oh. wanted to make sure you know that. <laughs> All right. It's going to come back around for you when people are ready for it. Oh, cool. um, so it's, uh, yeah, so I'm conscious of it. Um, and for me, my guides are very respectful. Um, and this is also probably due to my personality. They're not beating down my door telling me to do things. I, they're, you know, some people will say, oh, my guides are just talking to me nonstop. That is yeah. not my experience. Um, and they might say, well, we recommend that you might do this after I've checked in. You might say, well, you might, re we recommend that you go and you might want to meditate or you might want to move your body more. Or you might try not eating this food or, um, you know, this is what we see coming up, but never unsolicited. It's, it's exceptionally rare if it's unsolicited Be yeah. and to tell me to do something directly, I'm probably not going to do it. <laughs> how, how do you know, how do you know which energy they are like whether it's Pleiadian, Arcturian, like any of the different entities that you interact with. Because th there will be times where you'll say you might feel a shift in the energies uh -huh. to be able to tell because different things come through. H how do you experience that? 
Um, well, for me, I still do automatic writing a lot of the time, if, especially mm. if I want to remember the information, if it's really important. Sometimes I'll just check in and ask a question and that's fine. Mm. Um, I have different guides for different things. Um, so I have a guide who works specifically for health. Mm. And I have a guide, um, I have several guides that are 12th dimensional beings who come in and give me big picture information. Mm. Um, I work with a group of Syrians. They tend to be the ones who um, kind of talk about, uh, well, they'll talk a little bit about galactic history, but they also, a lot of the meditations, mm, they're yeah, the ones who yeah. come in. And, and after working with them all for so long, I'm aware of what their energy feels like, but at the very beginning, I didn't, mm. I didn't know. So when I would do the automatic writing, that was the first thing I'd ask. Um, they all have different ways of greeting me too. Mm. So sometimes I, I can tell by the, with the automatic writing, I can tell by the writing itself as it starts. It's like, oh, okay, this is who it is. And I can feel mm. the energy. Um, sometimes if I'm not sure, um, I've had new guides pop in. Um, I'll ask, I'm like, who? And usually they'll tell me. Mm. Um, and I'm like, who is this? And I've learned over the years to be discerning. Mm. Um, early on, I had some experiences where I wasn't the one channeling, but other people were channeling and, and I did what they had asked. They asked me to go to the kitchen and grab something out of the fridge. And I came back and they're like, why'd you do that? It's like, because you told me to. And they're like, well, Why? And um, I didn't like being taught a lesson that way. Oh, mm. And I never forgot it. Mm. Um, they're like, don't ever do anything because we tell you to. You have mm. to check in and see if that resonates with you, if you want to do it. And I just fumed about it. Mm. And I mean, the Pleiadians would never work <laughs> with me that way because I'd probably never talk to them again. Um, but <laughs> I got the lesson and the guides um, because the Pleiadians are, had always said to me, you know, you, you need to use discernment. You need to take what resonates and leave the rest behind. And they're always upfront with people about that. Um, they really want us to stand in our power and decide. It's, it's like advice that you get from a friend. Sometimes you get good advice and sometimes not so much. So um, they're big on using discernment. But that's kind of a combination of things. What I feel, if it feels uplifting. Right. Um, you know, when I first started to channel, I've probably been channeling for about a year. And um, some of you probably know Nora Harold. Um, mm. I met her around that time. Uh, we were all living in Chicago along with another friend. And the three of us would get together and channel almost daily and play because it was yeah. play at that time. And one person would channel, one person would be the person asking the question and then the odd man out got to kind of listen and see if they were getting the same thing and there would be times where the energy would shift and early on we might not have recognized it individually but somebody would go have you noticed that the energy feels different and at that point we kind of had to reset because somebody else may have come in because we weren't we were still working at creating a really strong clear connection and that comes over time. It's not something to be afraid of. It's just something to be aware of because um, the guides always liken it to meeting people uh, on on the street. You know, do you want to open up and have a conversation with everybody? Some people are great. Maybe your new best friend, you know, uh, but some people, no, <laughs> it's not interesting, interested in, in maintaining that connection. So I had a little what I would say is kind of an intense training for that year and learning how to maintain frequency and to become aware of the energies and who exactly I was connecting with. It's my very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> Not long enough. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Judy, you've got your hand up. Hop in there. Hi, it's really nice to see you in person. Well, nice to see you. Um, I have watched uh, Gaia and uh, your session there over and over and over. I just love it. Um, one of the things I had in mind here is um, my contact experience is not like anyone else's that I've heard of. And I had some question about it because it feels to me more like I was brought here around three to four years old. And at that time, my grandparents right, lived right next door to 
the uh, Yakima Indian Reservation, and there was a lot of activity because I was born in 1948. Um, I can remember distinctly these very tall beings of light. And when I think back and what they looked like in my mind, I would consider them to be like, um, they weren't gray, they weren't the tall whites or anything like that. They were, they were more like the mantis. And I can remember crying and crying and crying and begging them not to leave me here. I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to be on earth. And they told me that I needed to stay here, that I had things I had to do. Well, interesting thing about it is my mother and father uh, all have a negative RH factor in the blood, and yet I'm a negative, and they're all positive. Excuse me. They're all positive, and I'm a negative. I have no idea where that came from. Because none of my other relatives, and I'm considered to be relatives, has that negative RH vector. So I've always felt like I was brought here to be in this body for a reason. And that's because I feel so much love for humanity. And it's like I'm supposed to be here just to love people regardless of their thoughts or beliefs, and just give them love and, and help them find their love inside themselves. I mean, I don't consider myself a walk-in, but maybe I'm a hybrid. I don't know. <laughs> that was my experience. And it was so, it was never anything negative about it except for them telling me I had to stay here. Because I didn't want to be here. <laughs> I wanted to go with them. And I can remember putting my arms around what I would, would consider to be the legs mm -hmm. and holding on to them and begging them not to leave me here because these people here didn't like me. It was crazy. Yeah, maybe the piece can talk a little bit more about it. Um, but I think a lot of us have that sensation as well that you're, that we're like, oh, please don't leave me on this rock. <laughs> please don't leave me with these crazy people. Um, so that's, it's a beautiful story in terms of you and and why you feel like you're you're here. Um, so thank you for sharing that. But I'll, I'll see if we can't get the piece to comment a little bit more on that. That'd be awesome because I just yeah. I've always wondered about that because I I've never considered extraterrestrials to be negative, and then people start talking about reptilians and grays. I'm going. That was never my experience. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's just like there are all different kinds of people. There are all different kinds of ETs. Um, you know, there's so many hybrid projects that are going on on the planet. The, most of them have nothing to do with humans. A lot of them have to do with other life forms, exactly. a lot of aquatic life. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the guides and I were talking about it yesterday because we were talking about DNA and DNA being an antenna and a transmitter and receiver of information and they were saying a lot of the aquatic life has a far more complex um uh structure and the information that it gathers and connects because um some of that life form is far more aware of what's happening in the collective realm than than humans were kind of cut off consciously from that and some of the aquatic life is not um and so as they are working with, in many cases, their genetic line, because they've donated genetic material to these species, they're learning not only about the species here on Earth, but about the entire collective. So they don't really need to work with humans. They can get what they need through um, some of the hybrid projects with the aquatic life. Awesome. Yeah, fascinating. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit that, that question with the piece. Um, Anita, you want to chime in with your question with Wendy? I just have a question and I don't know if you can answer it. It was about two and a half years ago. It was in March and it, how, it was just literally when the pandemic started, um, like March 18th or 20th. And I woke up one day and I had a mark on the back of my, on my back. It was, um, it was a burn on the, on my back and it was right on, on my spine. And it was right between my shoulder blades. And my first sense was that it was, 
it was a visitation. And, um, but I really am really curious as to what it, what it was exactly. And um, I was literally getting, I was getting ready to go to Mount Shasta in a week. So it was before, just one week before I went to Mount Shasta. And um, it, I definitely sh- felt a shift in mm-hmm. my being. Like I just felt like just so much more empowered. And I just felt like I cannot be swayed. I cannot, yeah, I just have, I I don't even know how to explain it, but I definitely feel more empowered in my knowing. And, um, and I, and I definitely felt like it was, um, an uh, ET. Yeah. And, um, can they help you with an upgrade? They help give you an upgrade. And um, sometimes that happens in the physical field or in the um, energetic field, but it, the energetic field creates the template for the physical body. So sometimes that, even though the work is done in the energetic, it can still show up in the physical as a mark. Um, and that's what I'm hearing for you. Okay. Um, but they were helping to give you an upgrade um, to and what what does that mean exactly that we're given an upgrade? It just means that it it helps strengthen our system to hold higher resonances. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that can mean um, connecting. Well, they're showing me that they're reconnecting kind of the pathways of energy flow. Sometimes they get con- disconnected through fear programs. Uh, it, there can be genetic line programs that can create interference. So they're... Uh, kind of working on the energetic pathways so that that energy can flow uh, again. So that's kind of what it means for that upgrade. That's good. You know what? I've also been having a lot of um, physical problems. Um, and I know it's the frequency and the energy. I'm just extremely sensitive. You know, I've been doing energy work for 20 years and I am literally having just a lot of problems out in the world. Um, a, around a lot of things. And so I was wondering, is there anything I can do um, to help me with that? Really work with grounding mm-hmm. um, and specifically pulling up support from Mother Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, for a lot of us, we're much more comfortable getting the higher energy going up to get it. Mm-hmm. Because when we connect with earth and we connect with the collective consciousness, it doesn't feel so good. So there's a resistance to wanting to connect with that, but um, that will help your body. It'll help strengthen your body. It'll help you to feel that you aren't as impacted by the energy around you. Mm-hmm. So um, whatever you can do to ground, there are lots of ways to do it. You can work with crystals, pieces mm-hmm. of like tourmaline. Um, Grounding mats. Yeah. I've got one in my computer here. Really? Grounding sheets. I'll post some links. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Yeah. Those are all good tools. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll post in the chat uh, or below the video. We'll have some links to some of the uh, helpful grounding technologies. Who do you like, Earthing? Yeah, I use the Earthing brand stuff. Um, you know, there's several out now. Um, they were sort of like the, the big ones, but yeah, I, I have the sheets and, um, so at night when I sleep, it's, I'm getting grounded and, uh, obviously you want to a natural, the natural stuff. You want to go as much as possible and just go walk in the, on the earth. Very right. Early. But, uh, but I've tested with my meters, um, the, 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 uh, uh the stuff works like, so when I'm. Mm. Uh, when there's EMF in the air and I touch uh, and I have my meter and I touch the, the, um, the grounding sheet or my grounding mat, the, the EMF goes down. So it basically, because you're grounded, it doesn't stick to you in a sense. It just goes right through you and, and the, the, the earth absorbs it. So um, it's legit tech um, and there's new, new uh, findings all the time. So definitely I'll have some links below yeah, the video. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Very nice. Uh, the mat too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Charmaine, you you wanna you wanna jump jump in? Yes, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Hello. 
Hi, it's so nice to have this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for coming on the call and thank you, Ruben, for setting this up. Um, I just wanted to say two things and then ask a question. Um, first of all, I really, uh, I really appreciate uh, the clarity of your channeling. It's always felt uh, like a very clear, um, uh, the information that you bring forward feels very clear. Uh, and that's been uh, super helpful for me. I've been, um, I found, especially during the pandemic, I like so many people uh, was having a very difficult time and got a lot of strength from the wisdom that the piece shared, but also that you shared. And uh, uh, so I wanted to say thank you for that. One thing also uh, that I noticed and I really appreciated during the pandemic, a lot of channelers had an opinion about like, oh, well, this these guys say you should get a vaccine. These guys say Trump's the savior. And I was like, what? This didn't, it didn't resonate for me that way. And I, I loved the neutrality of the information that was being shared, that you were sharing. Uh, it, it, it just felt like it was uh, empowered people to make their own choices and didn't polarize um, people so much. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that too. Thanks to the peas and that information. Um, my question, though, uh, regards uh, is in regards to light language. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first, um, I, I think you were one of the first people that I heard speaking light language. And um, I, I grew up in a very religious home. Uh, and so in the church, people would speak in tongues. And to me as a kid, I, it, was, it was really scary. It didn't feel comfortable at all. Um, uh, but of course, to my uh, uh, to other people in the church, they thought it was amazing, right? That God was speaking through people, and people would chant on one side, and then on the other side of the congregation, answer whatever was being said, and then someone would translate. Um, and that's what came up for me at first when I heard you speaking light language, and I remember sharing it with my sister, saying, "This is so awesome! We don't need to watch documentaries about aliens; we can listen to them like directly." Um, and they heard it too. And they're like, that sounds like speaking in tongues. And so I just wondered, uh, have the peas or have you ever heard any kind of connection to that? The way different religions um, speak in, in tongues. And is that related at all to light language? It um, is. So it, it's in essence the same thing. But remember, light language is comprised of light, sound, sacred geometry, and then all of the information that is, is carried in that waveform. So you're going to get different frequencies depending on, you know, where people are connecting, what they're pulling in. So it may not feel good to you um, if the message and the energy is not um, in resonance with you. But I have asked about that and they said, yes, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just... Um, They're saying, think about English uh, and, and people speaking in English, and it's what they say and how they say it that makes all the difference in the world. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Jermaine. And usually, Wendy, you, you, you have this beautiful sort of meditation that you walk us through. Are you going to, can you do that for us? Or I can, yeah. The short. <laughs> That, we'll try be... to do a short version of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually okay. is about 10 minutes long, um, okay. which I always like to do because, you know, when we start to connect, um, sometimes we can we can close that root chakra and kind of not be in our bodies. So that helps us to ground because uh, if we're not grounded, then we can't retain the information and we can't stand in our power. So uh, that's why we always do a meditation at the beginning. Yeah, and, true. you know, if you've never experienced the Pleiadian Collective, they are about 2,500, 2,600 beings of light. They don't have physical form and they align with Alcyone, which is the central sun in the Pleiades star system. So they're here really to help us to become stewards for the planet. They're here to help us remember our history, um, our personal history, our galactic history, uh, and to teach us how to, how to manifest. So, um, yeah, that's who they are. As yeah. I, I think I said before, they work with tone and sound, which is why mm -hmm. their dialect is different than my own. It's not any one particular dialect. It's just tones and sounds that resonate with you at a cellular level. So you want to make sure you drink plenty of water over the next several days just to help move the energy through the body. Awesome. So, um, all right, we'll get out of the way and we'll see where we go. 
All right. So uh, as we work today, we ask for assistance from the beings of the highest frequencies of light and love. All others we bind from us. So take a deep breath in. And see yourself in your mind's eye. Notice the quality of your energetic field. Is it light? Is it heavy? Are there hot spots, dark spots? Is your body buzzing? Are you feeling numb? Are you hot? Are you cold? And where's your mind? Is it quiet? Is it active? If it's active, is it positive? Is it negative? Just observe without judgment. And as you breathe in, imagine a beautiful ray of golden light moving from the center of the universe into the galaxy into the solar system, past the inner planets, into Earth's atmosphere, and down through the crown of your head. And this beautiful golden light moves into each and every cell of your body. Rebalancing, restoring, sharing knowledge and information. Bringing awareness and life force energy into each and every cell, every molecule. And as this beautiful ray of golden light sweeps through your body, moves down through your feet, down through the core of the earth, where this beautiful ray of golden light melds with the heart light of Mother Earth. And all of the knowledge and wisdom of Mother Earth is infused into this beautiful ray of golden light. And this light moves back up through the earth, through the bottoms of your feet, and moving into each and every cell, sharing the warmth, the light and love of Mother Earth. with every molecule of your being. All you need to know for the well-being of yourself, for the balancing of your body is contained within this light. And as you continue to breathe in, this light grows brighter and stronger. moving deeper and deeper into the body. And this light moves out through the crown of your head, out through Earth's atmosphere, through the sun, through the galaxy, through the center of the universe, where this information is shared with all life in the universe. All life in the universe responds in kind, sharing all of its knowledge and wisdom with this beautiful ray of golden light. And the process begins again. 
as the light emanates from the center of the universe, through the galaxy, into the solar system, through the sun, through Earth's atmosphere, down through the crown of your head, through each and every cell of your body, down through your feet, to the core of Mother Earth, where this light is then returned in an infinite loop of energy exchange and information exchange. You are, always have been, and ever will be, one with all that is. And so it is. Ah, yes, hello, dears. This is the Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective, and it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to connect with you today. So um, we've heard a lot of talk about ETs and connections. And just know, first and foremost, you all have a lot of support, energetic support, some from physical, some from non-physical beings, all who are interested in your well-being and curious about what you're up to and one, wanting to be of support. So know that that support is ever around you. Your guides hear you every time you ask a question and, and truly they respond it's just a matter of whether you are in the right space to receive the message. How do you know if you're in the right space? Are you in your heart center? Are you present? If so, then you are in the right place. How do you get heart centered? Think of something that makes you smile. It's as easy as that. The challenge is staying there. You will go in, you will drop out. You will go in, you will drop out. That is the human condition. But hopefully every time you put yourself in your heart center, you stay there longer. And every time you drop out, you don't drop as far and you are aware of it much sooner. So that is the normal process. So do not beat yourselves up because you are not where you think you should be. The fact that you are even aware of where you are is a success. It means you're present in the moment. Otherwise, you'd be daydreaming about something that happened yesterday or five minutes ago, or you'd be projecting your energy into the future where you're not standing. Neither one of those things is... Um, uh, is using the full force of your energy. You you have to be present in order to use the full force of your energy. Otherwise, you're trying to connect with the now moment you're not standing on and you're, you're putting life force energy into that moment and you're not standing there. So keep yourself coming back to the present, to the heart center. All right. So once you're there, your guides will answer. You'll hear the answer. You might dismiss it as your imagination, but go with it. And uh, if you need confirmation, ask for it. And if you say, all right, well, I think this is what you're saying, guides. Is this my confirmation? Uh, and you wonder about it. You might see repeated patterns or numbers. Then take it as such because the thought would not cross your mind otherwise. All right. You wouldn't think, oh, is this my confirmation? Unless it was. So that's, that's a little tidbit here at the, at the beginning. We know there's a lot of ground to cover. So we're just going to see where you'd like to start. Uh, hi, Pease. Good to, good to connect with you again in this way. Um, it's been a minute. <laughs> um, but not, not as long as you think. Not as long. <laughs> yes. Not as long we are ever present with you. Totally. 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 Uh, and I've been tuning in uh, over the years um, with, with Wendy's channeling. So it's, it's been a, an awesome journey to continue this journey. So thank you for, for going along the ride on, on my platform and my show. And um, not to get too away from the heart, but to get a little grounded, talking about ground zero, today's a, a quite the um, anniversary for yes. a major event that has happened in our uh, human collective. And I kind of wanted to get the peace perspective on the the event, the energy behind the event, and, and where's that uh, at now, because it seems like we're still unfolding and still discovering and, and learning about um, these things. Well, when you ask where the energy is, there are lots of levels and layers to that. So it depends mm. on who you're asking and what their perspective is. Um, so there are some who are still in mourning. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, some who still are experiencing post-traumatic stress. Those who are present. Um, a lot of the fear that was triggered and activated in the collective consciousness. And then there are those who don't think twice about it. Um, but 
you know, it was a manufactured event. We've said that from the beginning and it yeah. was done for multiple reasons. Um, you know, to cover up information, it was there to elicit fear, it was there to create certain scenarios in order to generate wars that uh, allowed access to ancient relics and major portals on the planet. So there are many, many different levels and layers to the event itself. And then again, who you ask, who has access to what bits and pieces of information will make all the difference in their perspective of what they think transpired. Um, but what happened then is going on today. And it's right. the same game. It's the same players. Um, you know, they're using tried and true methods to alter your brain waves, the way that you think, alter your emotions, the way that you feel, to get you into a particular limited range so that you are very easily controlled. Mm -hmm. The reason they want to do that is because uh, they want to stay in power. And that's really difficult for some people to even grasp in terms of extraterrestrials because extraterrestrials are participating in this. Um, so for some people, just to start looking at it from a very human level, here are the players who want to maintain power. Um, but it actually is an, an interdimensional game that is going on. There's, there's a lot of interdimensional activity. So it, oftentimes when you have the anniversary, it is for some reliving that energy some it's just a mirror of oh you know uh, you know there was this event which i really wasn't thinking about but gee it looks very familiar to this one and this one and this one so it can wake people up in that way absolutely um you mentioned uh, stargates in yes. uh could you elaborate a little bit about that we know the you know syrian uh, civilization and uh, other Middle East portals in Egypt, you know, there's several there. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on these stargates, this concept of stargate? So, yes, there are places on your planet where there is a convergence of energy that allows for, well, sometimes it's just the transmission of data. Sometimes um, there is the actual ability to create artificial wormholes in order to travel. And that's done. Um, you will see sometimes when you all go out to do your UFO events um, or, you know, you're, you're looking for activity, you will see ships that will come out of your sun. Mm. Um, and this is, in a sense, a stargate. That is where, in many ways, the term comes from. Um, but it's, there are energetic points all over the planet. It just makes it easier to um, connect in some particular locations because you are using the fractal structure of the universe to connect you to different points. So um, you're using power lines, as it were. It's easier mm -hmm. to move in those power lines or to access things when they are mimicking the patterns, the the, the microcosmic level, that microcosmic pattern mimics the bigger pattern. You're utilizing the energy lines that exist, the subtle energy lines that exist to, to move between those energies. And, and you said some are manufactured, so some are natural existing from the earth and some are created. Is that my understanding? They can be. Like there can be... Um, uh, there can be structures, technology that is is created to harness the energy that's already there. All right, um, it's almost like forcing a hole. Like Mother Earth is isn't putting enough energy into it to fully uh, just walk through a portal within the Earth. Um, but the energy can be harnessed through technology to to do that. And is, some of the spots there's technology involved. Is that what the Great Pyramid essentially is? The Great Pyramid is many things. Okay. Um, so it was used as a power generator. Mm -hmm. All right. It was used as a school, a multidimensional school, as it were, a training ground um, where you could enter the pyramid in different dimensions. And the reason you were able mm -hmm. to do that was because of the energy being harnessed, um, that it created a portal 
of sorts so that you could actually walk into it in different dimensional ranges. And so you had the uh, initiates uh, who would um, walk into the pyramid into a different structure in order to go through trials or to um, to have out-of-body experiences, sometimes to astral project. Um, not always, but occasionally it could be used for bilocation. Bilocation and astral projection are slightly different. In the bilocation, you've, you are reconstructing your physical body through the projection of your soul light. Um, and most of the time, these beings didn't need to do that. They were staying in higher dimensional realms where they didn't need to have a physical, a dense physical body. So uh, also, it was an antenna of sorts. So you could connect with other star systems. And this is why it's laid out in the pattern of other star systems. It's utilizing that holographic energy You as above, so below. So if you replicate it below, you can more easily connect above. You're tapping into the frequency uh, by the recreation of it. it. You're creating an alignment that's quite strong. And so it was used as a way to communicate uh, across the stars with, with beings in other star systems. And it was multiple stars, not just Orion, but Sirius. And then there are other pyramids on the planet um, who do the, they do the very same thing. Some of them align to the Pleiades. Um, Cassiopeia has got a few. Uh, those are much older. Um, and really those haven't been fully discovered yet, but they exist as well. What, one thing that came up yesterday's on yesterday's Frequency War um, sort of confirmation for me in my research is the connection of Sirius and the Anunnaki. And um, I was wondering if you could just touch upon that. I've heard different things that the Syrians helped the Anunnaki and then perhaps the Syrians are in the Anunnaki. You know, there's different ideas around the, the, the Anunnaki and, uh, and, and the Syrians' relationship? Because it's kind of a generalized term that's mm -hmm. used. All right, okay. you could think of it as you just saying ETs, aliens. So there are factions, there are bloodlines that mm -hmm. were interested in um, kind of suppressing a lot mm -hmm. of humanity's creative energy and utilizing and man uh, uh, utilizing humanity more in terms of slave labor. And there is the information that exists within your ancient texts about all of this. It's all there. It's all written down for you. It's just a matter of you all going back and looking at it. And um, your scholars are pulling out more and more of it. Many of the people who are interested in the UFO field are also becoming great scholars of your ancient works on this planet. Mm -hmm. So they are helping to supply that um, shall we say, more concrete proof uh, that more analytical people can, can take hold of. Right. Right. Um, so there are Syrians who were present who were interested in the well-being. All right. Um, some who were here at the same time of we will freight, we will say the Niburans. That's probably the best way to separate them all. Okay. So, um, you know, you've also had beings from the Pleiades who've been present and interacting. And Earth has a very long and varied history. Um, long ago, Earth was a vacation spot for many of the Lyrans. All right. Many of the Lyrans um, tried to escape some of the Lyran wars and found themselves here on this planet. So when it came time, uh, they, many of them chose to go down into density. They came through uh, Lemuria. Mm -hmm. Many of those beings were originally from the Lyran star system. And some of them went through a dissension process here. So they started out knowing that they were beings of light. They had full knowledge of that and they did not incarnate into a body. They downgraded their body to play here in this dimension. That was part of what they chose to do. So that was um, started about 450,000 years ago that the Lyrans started to do that. Um, but there have been many, 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 many species who've been here and played here and some that 
are still here that you are completely unaware of. Some have zero interest in connecting with human beings. Um, Some of them live in the depths of your oceans. All right, they have bases there and they work with the aquatic life. Um, You know, there's still parts of your earth that you have not explored. So they're there. And, um, you know, it is it is a very varied history that you have in terms of interconnection with ETs. And even with the um, Niburans, even within those bloodlines, there is a split in terms of how to work with humanity, um, you know, whether it's wiping them out, all right, because they become too advanced. So you introduce plagues, you introduce uh, famine, you introduce uh, natural disasters, you help to to recreate some of those in order to um, reduce the population and start again with their um, decline in consciousness, as it were. But this is all part of the game, all right? This is a game. This is a setup where this dimensional range that you're playing in the 3D version is all about dissension and reascension. Can you forget who you are? Can you play in the game of lack, limitation, and separation and come out of it? And and that's a very special experience to a soul because none of the other dimensions are like it. You know who you are. And at any given moment, you can project yourself as one that is one with all it is or as a being that is playing separate, but you know you're playing separate. You know the truth of who you are. And as humans, you've forgotten that many times, or you remember it in the moment, but you can't sustain it. Well, it is fun remembering. That's for sure. Uh, I'm I'm having fun. I know it can be a little stressful sometimes, but uh, having a good time. <laughs> so. Yes. I want to say one other thing here. Many, yes. as you start to remember, might have a lot of emotion surface. Give yourself permission to feel that emotion. You don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to figure, oh, this this was the event that triggered this emotion or, oh, um, this is the timeline where this fits in. Just give yourself permission to feel it and let it go. Just observe it. So at the beginning of the meditation, and by the the way, the the Syrians gave the meditation. Hmm. So uh, we just want to give credit where credit is due there. So um, as you are... Uh, just observing your energetic field as you did at the beginning. Um, If you take a moment and you look at your energetic field now, you'll probably notice that it looks vastly different. And it really is just a matter of taking a moment and reconnecting. So it is through the observance process of not saying, oh, this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong. It just is. It is the state of things in this moment. And as you do that, you are able to transmute the energy. And that will allow you to live pain-free. We always say pain is perspective. You can stay there for 30 seconds or 30 years. It's up to you. What's the difference? One, you keep reliving it. You keep telling the story and you're suppressing it. You're not allowing it to complete its journey. The energy was meant to move through you. Energy was always meant to be in flow. But what happens is that you clamp down. You say, oh, I don't like this. I don't want to feel it. And so the energy can no longer flow. And then it is held there until you have a similar experience and there's another opportunity for you to let it to flow, let it flow. But you say, oh, no, I don't like it. It's more intense now. And again and again and again, until what most of you will do is just simply blow. You'll have an experience and you'll blow up and you'll think, well, that was kind of out of, out of uh, scale for what was really going on in my life. And that's why, because it got suppressed and suppressed and suppressed. So when you actually give yourself permission to feel it, every other experience of the same resonance can come up and out. And you do that simply by observance. Um, the longest most of you can hold on to that is probably about 45 seconds. All right. Mm-hmm. If you're taking longer than that, you're probably getting lost in the story of it. All right. Good rem- yeah. Good, good reminder. Let's talk about the other question in terms of um, the three-year-old situation where... Oh, yes. Uh, yes. That so, was Ju- Judy, uh, I think. Yeah. Yes. In a sense, you were placed here and your your parents um, agreed to take you in and memory engrams were placed in there. So uh, they were able to do that with many in the community and it wasn't questioned really where you came from. 
Um, this will happen for many of you in terms of coming from other star systems or having a lot of access within your own energetic field of a particular star system so that you can bring through the lessons, the wisdoms, the gifts of that system. And many of you will feel heartbroken that you are no longer there. It is not so much about leaving this body to go home. It's about opening up to home in this body. That's what you came here to do, to bring home here. And what is home? It is your connection to source energy. All right. So um, for you, it's, uh, you don't have to know all the ins and outs. We know that, that there is a part of you that is completely content with the way things are. Um, and it's more of a curiosity, but um, you also can connect with your guides once again and start to get more information about the specifics of your journey here. All right. Oh uh, yeah, I've that would be a recommend. Happening. Yes, I've been finding that happening. In addition to that, um, when I have a question, I just have the knowingness just drop down. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, clear cognizance. It is a really strong frequency for you. So go with it. Um, and, you know, for most of you, you'll get information and then you start to pull it apart with the mind. <laughs> it doesn't always make sense to the mind. And so you go into doubt. Is this accurate? But in that moment, you're very clear. And the more you can start to observe that within yourself, the more you're going to recognize that that vibration is different and you'll start to honor it more and more. And you'll just know, oh, well, that's the truth. Because every time I experience that vibration, that frequency, I know it's the truth because it's come to pass or I got confirmation about it. So continue asking um, and that will help open a deeper dialogue with your own guides so you can get more information Great. and call them in. Oh, yes. All right. Yes, thank you. You're Thanks, very Judy. welcome. All right. Uh, Lucas, you have a question. Your hand is up. Hello. It's very exciting to be with you here in this way. Greetings, dear. So my wife and I have been going to Serpent Mound for a few years now and um, connecting with, well, I, my question is around uh, the rise of the Phoenix and the 7,000-year cycle. And if that is indeed related to Serpent Mound and some of that spiritual technology related to the magnetic field of the earth. So um, it does have a little bit of the rising of the energy there. And there is a, a cycle that that land is kind of in. Um, it's a regenerative cycle where that particular area it goes through. Some of that was constructed early on. So when the ETs were there, they created um, kind of a little time bubble for themselves. They had a very long lifespan. And so by creating kind of this time loop where the energy would circle around every so often, um, they were able to kind of go through some cycles very quickly and also allow some of the species that they were working with, the, the hybrid projects, to go through um, various phases uh, in a much more accelerated rate, a growth rate. So uh, what do we mean by that? So if you would think how long it would take for you to go through childhood, how many years it would take you to get to adulthood, that would be compressed. You'd complete a cycle within seven years. So um, there is a bit of that energy that is going on in that particular area. It is also set up um, in conjunction with some of the different star systems and the connection because of these ET beings. It is also there to remind you of your true divine nature. Um, when, when you encounter some of these sacred mounds, pyramids, it reminds you that you are part of a larger community. And that's important for you to remember. Um, because too often you're, you're thinking you're isolated and you're not. You are one with all that is. All so, right, did we help answer that at all? Yes. I, I'm, we've gotten some insights into how that site may have functioned with the standing stone being in the uh, center of a six-point vortex and allowing that magnetic energy to connect with the earth in that way. And I, I'm just really interested in... Uh, 
if it's valuable to share that information. As a documentary filmmaker, that's where my attention is now. And I, I guess I'm just looking for confirmation uh, to continue in that path. <laughs> you really don't need our confirmation. You're that's already right. here. You already know that that's what you want to do. So, yes, um, and it is important for you. And um, it hasn't really been ex explored fully yet for that particular area. This is one of those um, those energy points that we were talking about. So when that energy comes in from all the points, it creates a beam of light that goes up. And, and this can be used as an antenna for transmission of information and specifically transmission of consciousness. So um, one would be able to stand in the center and and astral project from there using the extra boost. Um, because when you astral project, there is a certain amount of energy that is required in order to access that energy um, and in order to disconnect from the body, as it were, um, but also just a surplus of energy that it can be sustained long distance. So if you are wanting to astral project to another part of the galaxy, you need a little extra energy and um, focus. It helps to focus you uh, as a soul so that you can astral project and communicate. And so that's in part what some of these sacred sites were used for. That's one of the purposes, but all of these sacred sites hold multiple purposes. Think about it this way. It's an awfully big undertaking for something that's just one purpose. And so they always had multiple uses. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes, our pleasure. Thanks, Lucas. Sounds like you've got your work ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> many, many, uh, many documentaries to be made on that. Oh, it's exciting. <laughs> awesome. Um, Michelle. You wrap your hand up. Hi. Um, just wanted to say thank you, Ruben, of course, as always. And then thank you, the peas. I just don't even have words to express how this feels right now, but tons of gratitude. And I have so many universal questions. Um, and I think they'll come when the time's right. And I feel like at this moment, I should focus on my three-year-old son who has pretty bad... Um, allergies and sensitivities and i was wondering if you could give me any insight energetically to um his allergies and sensitivities and where they're coming from and then also most importantly what i can do to start to heal him of those so it's it really is environmental um because this there are so many chemicals in your water in your air, in your soil. Uh, so it, it just reaches a saturation point because all of the toxins that you carry, um, that gets transmitted as well as your, um, uh, as the mother is creating this life within them. So that gets transmitted um, and then the toxic load that they're exposed to. There is always purpose at the soul level as well for a child to go through this. So, so know that at the soul level, he is also um, choosing this because it, you know, sometimes it can help family members to wake up. All right. So it's, it's forcing you down a path of exploration. And sometimes souls will come in saying, well, I know I'm going to go through this challenging time, but uh, I know that others can really grow as well as as myself, but I know others can really grow as a result of this as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to take it on. So, um, eating as cleanly as possible. All right. To give his body the opportunity to process out grounding is going to be really important, really, really, really important. So the more, um, you can work with nature, the more that you can even, you know, the grounding technology is fine, but nature is best. Um, that will help a lot in terms of strengthening the immune system as you're trying to help clear out the physical body. And there are loads of ways of doing that. There are many who've spent their life looking at how to detoxify the body. So um, there's not one path that's going to get you there. It's about 
um, in some ways we might say for you, it's trial and error, but there are lessons that you're going to learn through the process itself. So it's just cleaning yourself up uh, in the process of assisting your, your son as well. All right. Thank you. So you think it's more just dealing with the actual earth energies, toxins and stuff more so than me trying to, there were some of you spoke of um, holding the idea of what your body thinks it's afraid of, let's say it's pollen yes. and saying, I am, this is not a threat to my body yes. and putting your meridian line and the allergy releases. You can, yes. Um, it's it's far more difficult to do with children in a sense because you are not fully aware of all the subtle nuances of that soul and what that soul wants to hold on to, all right? Because the soul says, well, it's great to release it now, but I've set that up for myself so that I can deal with that in my adulthood, in my relationships, or you can't see the full blueprint oftentimes. For you, it's different, all right? Because you can check in with you. Um, so you can do that. That is one level to do it at the energetic level, but you've also got to do it at the physical level because if you continue to put the toxins in when the body is so burdened, the energetic work, um, it's helpful, but you also have to make that, that transition in the physical as well. Now, you know, we always say that the body is created out of the energetic template and that's absolutely true, but, but sometimes you get to the point where you've got to start from the outside in and not just the inside out. Um, so that is that is the case here. So you've really got to uh, look at some of that. Um, you can muscle test to give you some cues there of what is the problem in terms of um, what in terms of food or ear. Um, frequency waves are probably the biggest issue that right now. Sensitivity in terms of uh, electromagnetic fields. So you can do some things to make sure that dirty electricity is not running through the house, that that gets neutralized a bit. Um, the grounding will help. And, um, you know, there are lots of things that can act as a Faraday cage, as it were. And, and it's, sometimes it's not even so much blocking or shielding as reharmonizing the frequency so that it's not detrimental to the physical body. All right. So more so than food, we would say um, some of the electronics are really stimulating the body and then any sort of other uh, allergy, any sort of irritant in the body, which on its own might be rather mild, is creating some problems. Make sense? Thank you so much. Yes. Awesome. You're Thanks, Michelle. Well. All right. Olivia, you have your hand out. Yes. Hello. Um, first of all, just thank you so much, Ruben, and the whole interview with Ed team for creating this opportunity. This is so excited. And thank you, Peace, for being here. I'm so excited. So my question is pretty specific because I'm pretty sure that people live in, you know, places where there's nature all around. Um, and for me as well, but I live in the middle of New York City and I have just come from um, Sedona, actually. And my integration back to um, New York has been, it's been really, it's been really interesting. I'm learning so much. I already have learned so much living in a city. But my question is really about discernment and discerning what thoughts and feelings are mine. Because I've found that staying in my sovereignty um, after being in a very safe container in Sedona, uh, I feel like as soon as I came back to the city, I've just had to completely turn my dial off because every time I, I kind of turn up the, the volume, so to say, or the light, and I am receptive, I get these emotions and these thoughts that I don't, I don't know if they're mine or if, they're, or if it's like some fears coming up inside myself, but what it feels like is it's, the, it's a city. It's just the energy of the city. I hope I'm being clear enough. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, you are holographic in nature, all right? So everything that happens to everyone else also happens to you. Now, in order for you really to sense a lot of that energy, you have to have some level of that program in your field. Maybe for you on a scale of one to 10, it's a one. You walk out in the world and all of a sudden it's a nine. Through uh, resonance, 
when you experience that, it makes it start to vibrate in your own field. All right. So just uh, give yourself permission to feel what is sitting in your field so that you can clear it. Then you can also clear out your field um, on a regular basis. Just imagine running white light through the entire body, up and down, up and down, up and down. You might see it spiraling up, circling down, you know, in opposite directions, going up and down. Um, plants are going to be really good for you in your in your home for you to feel that sense of connection so that you've got that even um, if you're not on the ground level and you don't have a lot of nature around you necessarily. House plants can help you to reconnect um, with Mother Earth herself. So that's also something that you can do. And um, this is about you strengthening, holding your own, holding your resonance, holding your center. And the stronger you get at it, the brighter your field actually will be as well. So you're just learning now how to do it in um, a more intense environment. You have a good sense of what that energy feels like, having been in a place where there was plenty of space and you got familiar with the feeling of you. Now you are learning how to do it in chaos. You know, if you want to go meditate, it's easy to do on a mountaintop. Try doing it on the subway. Not so easy. Mm -hmm. So this is where you are. You're learning how to hold your own in the midst of chaos. And this is what everybody is doing right now. Um, so just clear your field out regularly. Release anything that doesn't belong to you or anything that is no longer of service to you. And throughout your day, we would recommend having a practice where you are doing this, where you take 10 seconds, 30 seconds, um, just to clear out your field and set a new intention, how you want to feel, connect with Mother Earth, and then start moving again. Now, when you start checking in at regular intervals, it will help you because you won't drop out as far. You'll catch yourself before you get all the way down into the, the pit and you can bring yourself back up. And this is what all of you really need to do. You need to have some sort of practice and we recommend doing it throughout the day, not just once in the morning or once at night. You need to sustain this energy and, and it requires repetition right now. All right. Thank you so much. So you're much. very welcome. So we're, we're running low on time. So I just wanted to get to um, Ken's question as well as uh, Christine. So Christine, they're, they're quite quite similar. Um, Christine was mentioning that she had this sort of vibration and buzzing um, that lasted a bit last night and wondering if you had any insights. And uh, we'll bunch Ken's question in here too. Um, he talked about during the light code seeing, um, seeing geometric shapes in his eyes. So I don't know if this, if you want to generalize or if you want to hit uh, each question specific. I know we're all feeling all kinds of different things lately uh, during these uh, crazy times. So the buzzing is often times bringing fresh energy into the body. A lot of times that's why people will feel that and you might have a sustained experience with it because it's it's getting all those cells to begin to vibrate and changing their resonance. Um, in terms of seeing the geometric code, yes, uh, it's quite common. Um, you know, Wendy will sometimes describe it as seeing a ticker tape, all right? Uh, if somebody's speaking it, sometimes it's symbols, sometimes it's it can be geometric um, patterns. So, you know, sacred geometry is part of the language of light, and that's not unusual at all, you mm -hmm. know? So that may be something that for this individual, they really resonate with geometry, and that's why they're seeing it. They may have had lifetimes of working with sacred geometry. And so it is a natural language for them, uh, a language of communicating with the soul because they've spent so much time. Um, you know, geometry is a language. So uh, it's natural. It may be natural for them. Where somebody else, they may focus on the color or somebody else may uh, focus on tones. All right. As they're hearing the sound because they've spent a lot of lifetimes working with tone and sound. All right. So it's different for everybody. And, and would you say is all this sort of part of this ascension symptoms we're, we're terming this now, where we're kind of going through these big shifts and people are having these unusual uh, 
experiences? We're hesitant to say symptoms because okay. that uh, the reason we say that is because you have so much fear around your health. And mm. when you say symptoms, typically it's ill health that's associated with that. Um, sometimes it's just about the body coming back into balance. Sometimes the body's burning things off. Um, sometimes it just feels different to you because you've never felt it before. And so you think, oh, this is a symptom. And it is so varied what is creating that for all of you. So we we would say don't look too deeply for the why. Just notice what it is about it that is grabbing your attention and check in with yourself. What do you need to know or do about it? Sometimes it might be nothing. Sometimes you might feel like, oh, this is my body cue. I need to move more or, oh, I need to rest more. Or, um, oh, I really, this is a body cue that um, my body's trying to get my attention. I need to go call, um, I need to call Ruben, all right? I need to, I need to go back and look at some of that material that I just watched. Mm -hmm. um, it's you checking in with you in that moment to see what you need to know or do from your body cues. Because your body is amazing and it is constantly giving you cues, but you have become socially conditioned to disconnect with your bodies, that your bodies are failing. Your bodies are not enough. They're aging. They're too fat, too tall, too thin, too short. They're too whatever. You've been sold a rather limited version of what is appropriate through the media, through television and film. And anything that doesn't fit that narrow vision is wrong. It's bad. There's a problem with it. So you've disconnected in many ways from your body. Um, the unhealthy diets for most people also disconnect. Um, and just unhealthy habits, stress, constant stress will keep you from connecting because stress keeps you in fight or flight. It keeps you in the operating system of the mind instead of the heart center where you have access to higher dimensional information. So... Uh, Check in. What is your body telling you? It's a great communicator. You just have to stop and listen. Awesome. Well, thank you, Peace, for your time and for your knowledge and wisdom and sharing all this, all these, uh, and these awesome sessions. Appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. We'd love to do a language of light activation for you all. Yes, like. please. That would be all amazing. Right. Yes. So um, we'll do a couple of short rounds here. One is to help you to clear out your energetic field. Another is to help you to ground. Then we want to help you with empowerment and confidence. All right. So it's all kind of combined into one. So don't try to figure it all out, but we're just going to present it to you. Now, um, to work with the language of light, typically we recommend three times a day for three days in a row so that you start to get a real sense of the subtle energy. But there's no hard and fast rule for that. You can also listen within yourself. So in other words, if you don't have the recording to come back and listen to, you can also imagine connecting to this moment again because it's recorded in your energetic field. And when you imagine connecting with it, you are connected with it and you can access the frequencies. Now, the language of light is like somebody playing a note on a piano so that you can find that frequency. Um, if we asked you to sing the note of C, most of you would be hard pressed to do that. You don't have perfect pitch. But if we played it on the piano for you, you'd say, oh, that note. Okay, no problem. And so this is what the language of light is doing as well as transmitting all kinds of information that you can then shift your own energetic field into resonance with. And this is you doing the heavy lifting. We're not doing anything except presenting you with the information that you then have to or don't have to. Uh, choose to engage with. All right. So nothing to know or do. Just relax. Take a nice deep breath. Take a nice deep breath. Mm -hmm. 
تبدا جوكوتو وتتقطع الرمري بريجيديري من هنا على وري من بريجيديري ورا نا 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 نوري لا لا ولا في جوكوتو وين من بريجيديري لا 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 وري جيدا على وري ايسا سكتاي هثنا على وري ايشي شي اكتوي اما هكلو را الرمري هي ايسا سكتوني ايسا نكتي هيرا ارا اخا اورا اما هكا اولى اما اكتي تي اما را ايشي شي اي هيسا اتكتا ارا ارا اما هيكتا take a nice deep breath Ibu tu juga tu, inda tu tu, ui dia beri juga tu, dia dia irar, mana beri juga tu, betul kata irar, beri juga tu betul tu, ram beri juga tu, dia dia dia, mui dia dia, jadi dia dia ralam mana beri juga tu, mana isa, indo, mana beri juga tu, ram mana beri juga tu, dia dia, mui beri juga tu, betul kata betul kata, kita arar, beri dia betul kata betul kata, betul kata, data ilai mana beri kata betul kata, inda ralam beri beri, mana ui 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 jadi jadi. Inda dede indui mana benda beri juga tetapi tetapi beri juga ni, iza ada arah mana beri juga tetapi tetapi ibu 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 beri juga tetapi tetapi kata aza di 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 inda luar ini mana es a luar ini mana uang beri beri juga tetapi arah arah apa kata? Hasa kau ti ibu ibu di kita a a we. Alright, take another nice deep breath. So we'll go ahead and we'll leave you here. But feel free to connect with us directly. You don't need Wendy. Just ground, heart center yourself, ask your question and listen. And until we hear from you, we are around, we are watching, we are waiting, and we are sending many, many well wishes. Wow. Thank you. That was amazing. Uh, what, what, what do you, when you do the light language, are you, are you feeling the, um, the energies of the beings and what goes through your uh, body and mind and heart too. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes it feels like a big push of energy. Yeah. And um, sometimes I'll know like, okay, we're focused on this right now. Um, we're focused on this kind of energy. Um, rarely is it like a direct translation of something. I just know that this is what the energy is for. Yeah. It felt a little... The, the last one at the end there felt like a newer type. I haven't really felt that one from from you, and maybe <laughs> maybe I missed some, but yeah, so felt like some new stuff going here. Yeah. So and like I said, sometimes it's yeah. multiple beings blending their energy. So it may sure. be somebody new who's come in with somebody old. So um, I never fully know, but like I said, you know, my my own guides are kind of gatekeepers for that, and my own soul. Because um, mm -hmm. my energy goes up, theirs comes down, and we meet in the middle. And right. then I allow the energy, um, like the translation, to come through. So it's not like anybody's in my body. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, your work and your, uh, and doing this in this way is, is super inspirational. And um, I know, as Charmaine said, you know, during these tough times, uh, the peace being as grounded and, and neutral, you know, and, and dissipating the, the energy and still throwing in some of those rough nuggets to hear. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, how do I process? But at least they give us the tools <laughs> to, <laughs> to move through these uh, rough times with uh, as little resistance as possible. So thank you and thank you, uh, Wendy, and thank you, Peace, for, for just this constant um, uh, in inspiration. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And thanks for having me here. It's been lovely to connect with you all. Thanks for tuning in. I uh, hope you like this interview. We actually do this every week on my membership portal page. You can access it through interviewwithed.org or uh, click on the link uh, somewhere in here. I'll put a link and uh, come over and join us. You too can ask questions. Every week we have new special guests and you get to ask questions directly to the channelers and to the beans that they channel. So see you in the portal.